este día tenemos eh, un invitado especial, es el doctor Willy Sun, que viene del, eh, es, trabaja, es un astrofísico de la División Solar Estelar y de Ciencias Planetarias del Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, de, de que, en donde trabaja desde enero de 1997. Sus principales líneas de investigación son astrofísica y las relaciones sol-tierra, así como los métodos de análisis y procesos fundamentales en gases y plasma. Eh, actualmente es editor de la revista New Astronomy y es autor del libro El mínimo de Maunder, eh, de, publicado en 2004. Tiene diversas publicaciones en revistas como Physical Review, Astronomical Journal, Astronomy and Astrophysics, Astronomische Nachrichten, en el Journal of Climate and Geophysical Research Letters and Earth Science Review, entre otras. Y pues ahora nos va a dar una plática precisamente sobre series de tiempo y webblades. Eh, le agradecemos al doctor su presencia eh, aquí con nosotros. Thanks for having me here. And, uh, okay, got it. Okay, that's fine. All right. I am indeed uh, very happy to be here, and uh, thank you all for coming. My job here today is, uh, I would say, rather simple. It's just simply trying to explain to you some of this work that we've been doing myself, and my main purpose actually to try to feature your brilliant uh, mathematician and physicist here, Dr. Victor Manuel uh, Velasco Herrera. His work is very, very good. That's why I started to collaborate with him in the last uh, two to three years or so. And uh, we've been really focusing very much on techniques and also way of uh, trying to look at uh, data from a different way. And then somehow, if you look more carefully and then have a much more accurate methods of analysis, then maybe you will get a lot more insights about what nature is trying to hide its secret. So the first picture I want to tell you is obviously the sun is very big. The physical scale is about 1 to 109. And this is an area or subject that I would say is very much confused, as is shown by a typical diagram like this, asking a very simple question. What is climate? It appears that uh, it seems to be very easy to make very, what you call, uh, pedagogical statements, but then somehow it never quite fits the whole story. You know, climate, is it just about temperature? Is it about incoming sunlight? Is it about latent heat flux, right, outgoing radiation? By the way, I do encourage you to ask questions, of course, please don't be shy, and uh, I'm one of those who really prefer to be less formal. And of course, the key thing is about the ocean. And we have to master all of that. So as one particular definition would go, to study climate means, really, really means, not only the atmosphere, that's for sure. Of course, the atmosphere is also important. But then you somehow need to know something about astronomy, solar physics, geology, you know, all these different words, climatology, meteorology, geology, paleoecology will be very important in my talk because I'm going to show some of the work that's done from UNAM here, geochemistry, sedimentology, so on and so forth. So it is an area that I would say one should not presume too much knowledge on any issues in the sense that one can rule out certain specific mechanisms very strongly. This is a typical mistake in my humble opinion after 25 years of studying this topic very carefully because my job is only about the truth, nothing else. What really works? So let's start with something very simple, which is actually energetics, the incoming sunlight. If you look at this picture, if you plot, let's say, the incoming solar radiation, NO mean, for the last million years until present, which is zero, if you take this NO mean from that perspective and global changes, you will see that because of the Sun-Earth orbit changes, right, put by Jupiter, Saturn, and so forth, that the annual mean changes appears to be extremely small, right? Remember, one million years is a long time. It's only half a watt per meter square, okay? I'm trying to introduce to you concepts such as this. Although it's useful for a bit of discussion, it doesn't quite get at the truth. So one has to look a lot more carefully. So even if one assume that this is, of course, purely assumed geometrical changes, right? You know that the, the Earth orbits actually have more circular or more elliptical, and then you have the tail orbits, 
of the earth with respect to the sun will be actually going up and down by a few degree, right? Three degree or so, not like Mars. Mars is about 60 degree. And then you also have the precession of the equinox, right? That's on the 22,000 years. But what I'm trying to point to you is that if you think about this picture, please, better think about a picture like this. Which means how the Earth system sees the incoming energy is really not respect to the net energy change per se. It's truly related to how the seasonal distribution of the sunlight is being prescribed upon Earth. So the example is that to explain the full changes of the glacial, which is the ice ages, and the interglacial, which is the warm period, you really need to, st for example, this is a famous theory by this uh, Serbian uh, mathematician and engineer that says by the name of Milutin Milankovic, I hope some of the students, so please don't mind some of the senior professor, I apologize. But to, to speak in terms of how this glacial and interglacial changes come from, apparently one of the biggest criteria would be actually how much the high latitude, which is at 65 degree north, summer insulation changes. Because the whole issue about how the ice sheet got built has nothing to do with how much energy you change, really. It's about how much the winter ice that keeps coming, but how much is actually melted away. So the summer season appears to be very important. Of course, winter is also important. But for that perspective, you can see. What I put here is actually the line for 2 to 3 watt per meter square that is supposed to be caused by the changes of atmospheric carbon dioxide level. Right? That's changing from, let's say, 200 to, to 300 or 310 ppm, so of the order of 100 to 120 ppm. But that amount of energy forcing is only 2 to 3 watts, whereas on an individual location, you can see the fluctuation, right? It's of the order of 100 watts per meter square. And there's no net energy change. Okay? What is telling you that the seasonal distribution of the sunlight is extremely important, and one should not neglect that. To bring that home, is to show you this actually two line here, the solid one, which is actually the present seasonal cycle, right? You know the difference between this is actually just caused by the, the aphelion and perihelion of the Earth and Sun orbit, right? So the change today, actually, it's only 90 watt per meter square. But if you think about the Eemian, which is the last in the glacier 100, you know, 130 to 120,000 years ago, or 115,000 years ago, that because of the Earth is more elliptical, because now we are very close to zero, right? The shape is almost zero. It's a slightly more eccentric, which is about 4% only. And you can see now, even if you assume there's no net energy change, that's why I plot the curve over, over right on each other. Just looking at the annual amplitude of the changes, it tells you that this Eemian is a very significant beast. Between that time, you are really, the Earth system is under a very harsh condition. Okay? Somehow I really try to emphasize that the seasonal uh, sunlight is very, very important and one has to really consider that. And of course, you see it's a factor of uh, about three, right? Larger than what it is today. So to compare Emian to today is not appropriate at all, actually. Although it gives you a bit of insight, right? What happened during one, one period. So now let's dive into the first aspect, which is astronomy, where I also spent a significant of amount of time by the way, I was very also silly in the beginning. I don't know anything about solar physics. I came from the background of plasma physics. I have no idea what a sunspot is, but I got a postdoc at my workplace. I worked very hard, and then I ended up writing a small textbook on it to encourage the students. As long as you're willing to learn and, and study very, very hard. I want to introduce a, a, a subject which you already hinted by the, actually how the Earth and the sun orbit changes. But there's another really much more interesting phenomenon that one has to consider. As you know that we have, we are, uh, the sun is just nothing but a yellow star, according to astronomy, because it's just very typical. Then you have a lot of planet, planetary system, actually, not only one planet, you have planetary systems around. And it turns out that I would say, although the issues is very controversial and many, many people have made very strong claim one way or another, some make that, oh, this sun-planet interaction is very important. Some say that no possibility of any aspect of this idea being true. Meaning, Jupiter and, uh, and Saturn, for example, so the first thing is just a perspective from the Mars. This is from uh, 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 a Mars landers, as you can see. You can look at the sun as well. Not from Earth, from Mars. But the first point on this sun-planet interaction is that 
Copenhagen is not quite right. I hope that I don't get burned to, to death immediately. Because where is the center of the where, where is actually the sun? The sun is actually not the center of the Earth system of the sun, uh, solar system, right? Because the center of the of the of, of the of the solar system actually is, is actually for the sun is moving around quite a bit because the sun is actually moving quite a bit as shown by these orbits. Okay, this is actually showing you different position of the center of the sun with respect to what we call the very center, which is the center of mass. And these are motions that are being pushed by Jupiter and Saturn mainly, of course. And then the point is that even though we are co-moving, that's important, we, we are co-moving okay, together with this system, but this fluctuation is really large. Okay? It's of the order, as you can see in the order of AU is not so interesting, but it's of the order of a four or five or six solar radii. Okay? which is really a significant thing. Then, in terms of actual physics, you can imagine there could be other effects that one should study. Okay, that was uh, just to show you a typical example of how large the region of this movement is. I mean, you can see this is actually the, the radius of the sun, just to show you the, the movement so of the order of four solar radii or so. The idea then, perhaps that there will be some idea in which, as you know that the sun is a rotating, convecting body, right? So you're rotating and convecting, that's how you generate magnetic field. But then somehow maybe the way the magnetic field are being generated are being controlled also by how this, this actually spin motion versus the readjustment of the whole angular momentum of the planet of the solar system. So that there may be some effects. Okay, this is why I'm saying the whole physics is not completely ruled out. On the people that make a strong claim, of course, it's about tidal effect. Nobody has ever made a claim that you know uh, the tidal effect of the Jupiter is very strong on the on the Sun. That is not that is true, of course, because it's very weak. But we are speaking about some specific physical mechanism that actually still need to be studied more carefully, and we are making progress on those topics as well. So let's jump into solar physics. <coughs> Hopefully, I'm not going too fast, but I hope that you all can understand what I'm trying to say at least. A picture like this really doesn't tell you much, but then the sun is indeed a very complex body as well. You have indeed the true energy source, which is from fusion of hydrogen, then you make helium, then you have an outer zone in which that actually, remember this is a very dense stuff, if you're actually talking about how the photons wanted to diffuse from here to here, it takes at least a hundred million years, a uh, hundred thousand years, or three hundred thousand years, okay? but. If you think in terms of how the transport can go through wave, pressure wave restoring force, or gravity wave, or, or some of this rotational, convectional kind of wave, there, there is a fast, easy communication actually, even from way, way inside, where photon cannot communicate so effectively, but can actually transport energy out towards here. That's the idea that I was trying to talk about the sun-planet interaction. But then, on the outer surface of the sun mainly is what we have in terms of the information very typified by the feature the magnetic field feature called sunspot you know and then you have a details of the structure the the difference hopefully some of you know umbra is the place where it's the coolest it's mainly indeed that uh, some of the convection along the field line is not is prohibited so therefore it's a bit cool and then on the outside, the, the field line is much more uh, angular, so it's, it has a region called penumbra. And then, you see, and then sun, on the surface of the sun, you have very complicated phenomenon, energetic phenomenon, a flare event, a prominence. You know, you can have so many of these complicated things that's related to a lot of this hydrodynamics and uh, magnetohydrodynamic instability. And these are indeed subjects worthy of study, I would say. Now let's take a a look at uh, what is available on the outside feature of the sun. This is a typical example of, of taking a, a white light picture, or oh, this one actually is done in, uh, in ultraviolet, right? And you can begin to see some of this feature that really we would wish we know a lot more. It turns out that the topic is really, really hard. This is why I have uh, studied the sun from the perspective of not only the sun, and later I want to introduce to you that you study sun-like stars, and then you study many, many more things before you get anywhere close to what you say a secure thought knowledge. This is a, a view of the, uh, a detailed view of taking a picture of the sun. 
It turns out that it's not only this feature is important, it's not this is important. Even here is not so important. The granule, this is like things are boiling. Imagine the porridge is boiling, so you have all this convection pattern, right? The cooler region is downflow, basically. And then you got upflow and things like that. And then what we actually have now in terms of record is that since 1876, the Royal Greenwich Observatory started to take a daily picture of the sun. At least now we have some information about how actually the sunspot feature, the dark feature, if you try to quantify on the surface of the sun, you try to calculate the area. See, this is on the order of only 0.1 or 0.2% of the whole area of the sun. So sunspot constitute very, very tiny bit of the information about the sun. Think about it. So you have about 99.9% .9 of the stuff is actually need to be studied, okay, in terms of area sense. Then if you plot in terms of where sunspots are formed, it doesn't form in the polar region. It forms right around the mid-latitude, about 30 to 40 degrees or so, and then you can see the progression over time. This is very beautiful, actually. It looks like a butterfly, right, butterfly wings. <coughs> and then here's a much more simpler way to... To, to show you that, look, the peak of these sunspot numbers actually is not constant at all. Okay? It's actually changing and, 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 and varying all the time. And then much more important is that you have a period from about 1640 or so to about 1720 that is called the Mondo Minimum. It is not that during that time that you have no sunspot, but you do have very, very few sunspots. In fact, we even know enough about the, the, the whole distribution of the sunlight is that over these 70 years of period, you basically have only two spots appearing on the northern hemisphere. You have quite a bit of a spot in the southern hemisphere, but then they are very squeezed. The, the location of all these spots is very near equator, actually. 10 degrees, no more than like a typical one is about 30 degrees. So we have a lot of information and insights about how that. The job of physicists, of course, is to explain why it happened exactly. The problem is that actually the, you know, like to solve this full problem, you have to do the rotation convection. You have basically you need a Maxwell equation and Navier Stokes equation. You combine them, but no one has successfully tried to do that in full spherical geometry. So that is actually a long, long shot. So what we do now is that I'm trying to explain to you the at least the shortcut, but the way to understand this phenomenon and to demonstrate that we have some good handle on this topic. Okay, and then as you can see, this is for the more modern period, showing you the sunspot. Uh, as recent as the uh, last two weeks or so, you can see this maxima during this time period in 2014 is rather weak. In fact, this will be among the weakest of about 100 years or so if you measure it with respect to, to this time period. So uh, right now it's about right here. You see here? Right? And then people are already making a lot of speculation. It's not a very good idea to speculate too much, by the way. And also trying to offer predictions that have no uh, scientific background. So one has to be a lot more cautious. Although there are some things that we can say now, of course, which I'll try my best to, to tell you what it is. <coughs> All right. <coughs> I love a lot of cartoons. So you start from... Uh, now I'm trying to jump to the topic of full astronomy, which is to study the whole universe, right? Everything and everything. Excuse me. Uh, I, I have a habit of trying to study too many things, so sometimes a bit of dangerous, but then you have to be very careful. There are a lot of interesting things to learn. So what I want to introduce now is basically that the sun, as I say, is nothing but so-called main sequence star. Okay? It's burning hydrogen inside. And, and so the idea is that if the universe is so big, if we have so many stars around, because in the Milky Way galaxy you know you have about 10 billion stars, so why don't we try to study them? The whole idea is that, as I told you, the physics is really, really difficult. No machine, no human mind, no mathematician can actually solve this basic equation that we know is roughly correct. But then we, so the idea then is that why don't we just empirically observe and measure quantity like magnetic field and how much the sunlight is changing or the starlight is changing, okay? And then try to maybe build some empirical understanding of this idea. So. The whole idea then I want to introduce to this very powerful project. I started from the background of studying only a hundred stars. But I have to tell you, we have done heroic work. Our work has obtained observation of sunlight stars for about a hundred of them at Mount Wilson Observatory in California. And we have observed this for 45 years or so, which is really a record okay, for a hundred stars. So imagine how much statistic we built. But today, 
We have fast track forward. We have technology that is helping us. So you can go from one star to about 40,000 stars. All you need is a CCD. All you need is some smart design, go up to space, clear space, put in a location, and then you have this CCD that you can actually a field of view of almost uh, about 140,000 stars. And this is the so-called NASA Kepler mission. Unfortunately, by now, when I tell you the, the, the satellite uh, uh, battery is already run out, so they actually took only three and a half years or four years of data. But the point now is that if you have three or four years, but then you have a statistics of almost 100,000, 150,000 stars, and then much more narrow, what we call exactly sunlight star of uh, 40,000 stars, then you probably will learn enough, actually, because maybe that you watch this star A is doing something, and then the other star is doing one minimum, the other star is doing up and down, all these things. So you try to combine through physics that you can learn something more about this. So here's the field of view of where the search scope is. Roughly, you're trying to get as many stars in your CCD, and then all you do is uh, have a very high precision photometry measurement. So remember, this is also not easy, by the way. You're trying to detect a change that is one part in 100,000. Because we know already each of the spots is only so small, 0.1%, right? It's making very tiny blip, but you have to have good control. But, but technologically, we can do it now, of course. This project was planned for almost 15 years. And then rejected, 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 and then, of course, <laughs> finally successful. Which is to tell you that science is a hard business. You have to be very patient. I was on a competing team, so I'm not on Kepler team. We were, our project, of course, we were on a competing team, but it's okay. Whoever brings the best science should win. So this is just a typical example. This is plotting the, the measurements of those things, the variability of the, you know, caused by the spot or, or even a bright, brighter element or the faculties. And it shows you that all these stars, and then this is showing where, where roughly the sun should be, the, yellow, uh, the red line, and then this is as a function of the brightness of the star itself. Okay? It's rather a complicated chart, but just to show you that this is how much data we got now. Thank God. And what can we learn from this? The first thing you know is that, remember, we have also done measurement directly on the sun, of course. This is a NASA and ESA, European Space Agency project, the SOHO project, where you measure the sun now, so this is only for 30 days of data or so, so you measure, you see how it varies. In fact, the magnitude there is, is of the order that I told you, one part in uh, 10,000 or one part in 100,000. And to show you that sample a different type of Kepler stars, some of them are very quiet, quieter than the sun, some of them are actually very similar like the sun, and then there are also that extremely large amplitude variation. These are stars that are actually vary on the order of 1%, guys. You never see this in the sun yet. Maybe in the past the sun will do it, right? That's the idea. So what, what happened to all these statistics? This is just another example to show you that the SOHO data and then the Kepler data. What I'm trying to show you is that there are, in terms of Kepler, because the sun, we have the vantage point of being so near, so we're able to measure with much higher precision. So if you look at the final, well, let me make this one small conclusion first, because there have been a lot of rumors around that trying to suggest that, you know, our sun basically is so unusual that uh, if you study the sunlight star, you will not learn anything about it, which is not so correct, okay? That has been claimed in many, many prominent places. I am not married to any scientific conclusion or results, because every result is all transient in a sense. You just need to really, really confirm it or verify it or somehow. But this result really confirms what we've been saying for 20 years at least. I'll show you one of the results that we have said. What we have said is that the sun is nothing but a normal star, and you can study them in terms of its magnetic activity and its brightness activity. Then from that information, you can deduce quite a bit about what the sun actually happened on the sun. Because the physics is physics. You know, there's nothing more or less about this is exactly that you learn you know, how much magnetic heating you provide how much brightness you get okay that's basically the idea so now we have a statistic from kepler that tells you that the sun is not unusual photometrically quiet compared to its neighbor and then even explain these are of the latest results of course coming out from uh, kepler which i think is a very nice thing actually to be able to find that there are some you know good work that's being validated by even better work okay so just to give you a perspective, this is now plotting the range of variability, which means it's uh, the very small variability around here, 
and then very very high variability over here the blue curve is basically what is observed by SOHO which is the, the direct sun observation in terms of the brightness activity because you guys know right the reason why you want to know that is because this is the energy input to the climate system if it changes that much it's directly trying to mean that for the earth system and the blue curve is the sun and then this is the Kepler statistics what is showing you that even here it's because Kepler don't have the resolution so this part here is more or less agree what I'm trying to tell you is that from the study of sunlight star you can see there are a lot of high tail that means larger variability much much larger than what the sun is saying but the low end completely agree okay, it's a very comfortable thought with what I'm trying to tell you then the sun actually can vary a whole lot more okay that's at least something useful and this is based on the work that I've done with a Harvard graduate student Ji Zhou Jiang in 1994 look it's 20 years old why do I keep showing old results because you know why no observation as long as ours has ever superseded this work so we have produced this work saying that the sun from modern minimum to present could change on the lower bound by order of 2.2 percent the mean is of the order of 0.4 percent the high is of the order of 0.7 or 0.6 percent okay and so far i have to tell you most of the climate modeler only want to focus on this part they never want to consider this which is actually then you don't quite understand the system no you're missing the whole point because this is completely a valid scientific result that ought to be pursued okay but that's what I'm trying to tell you study the climate is very very uh, complicated not only in the sense of the science sometimes the politics can be very complicated but I like this picture because it's taken from a Swedish telescope in Tenerife Spain <coughs> of Africa and uh, it's trying to show you that the sun is extremely dynamic okay it's plasma it's fluid motion you got all kinds of stuff this sort of one explosion is probably will be enough to to do a lot of damage if it's actually directed to the earth one of the consequence of this sort of dynamic phenomenon like the solar flare or actually the outflow of charged particle called the solar wind they're actually a wind of some kind like the wind that you feel here this stuff essentially populate the whole solar system of the order of 100 M, uh, AU or so right from the distance to earth so we are 1 AU so 100 AU or so and what it does then is fill our, our whole solar system sphere with charged particle which will eventually will be controlling how the incoming galactic cosmic ray I hope some of you know what cosmic ray is these are highly energetic particles including even helium nuclei and some of those and what it does then is that there is a relationship in which that this galaxy cosmic ray will enter the Earth's atmosphere and then will start to produce what we call cosmogenic uh, particles like uh, beryllium 10 here right and here is showing you that when the Sun is very weak the solar wind is weak you have large production of beryllium 10 typified by basically what we call the sporo minimum this is the Mondo minimum that I spoke about where the Sun almost have no sunspot then you have a Dalton minimum period and you have the wolf minimum you have the woods minimum right and just to show you that this measurement from uh, beryllium 10 in the ice core can give you some information about what the sun is doing for the past 10 uh, a thousand years ago at least about a thousand years and we we have a lot more information but just to give you that this fluctuation level is certainly not constant because it doesn't have to change by the way right if it doesn't change then you should measure flatline okay and that was thousand years now from Greenland ice core you can go as far as also about 10,000 years and these are the kind of data that Dr. Velasco and, my, and myself and many many colleagues are trying to analyze and trying to understand what it means and it's trying to show you that over the last 10,000 years you can see you have very very strong activity time period you have very very weak activity time period okay the detail is important of course then the idea is to analyze what is the information content in all of this which will very soon feature some of the work by Dr. Velasco and this is just to give you an example that sometimes you can see over let's say this time period or this time period I mean this is a so-called modulation potential which means the Sun is so weak that almost couldn't do anything so all the thing is coming directly from local interst interstellar medium so these are extremely weak stuff by the way if you measure this in sunspot number guess what you have you will just have zero this is why sunspot number is not very useful either when you're near minimum but when you measure something like this you can tell the difference between 
poorer minimum and you know this other minimum all these different things and then for the maximum you can see the sun is not only always doing weak stuff you also have some very energetic time period like this right around here 300 400 AD or so okay so it has a range that one has to study well that just tells you that all the things that you need to study including glaciology because you need to study how the eyes accumulate right and how to date those things chronology you need the chemistry to work it out and I'll show you very soon that what we analyze because so far in terms of studying the solar activity we have uh, we can use something like the beryllium 10 we also can use something like the carbon 14 I hope some of you know carbon 14 is basically one of these uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, this uh, radioactive uh, uh, stuff that is being produced and then it has a decay time of a, a half-life of almost like 5,800 years and then but if you measure some of this carbon-14 that stay in let's say three rings you would be able to pro provide a lot of information because you know that this carbon-14 there's no other sources to produce this this carbon-14 so if you know the date and timing of some of those three the way it dies and then the three rings you should be able to reconstruct the solar activity so you have beryllium 10, carbon 14. I want to introduce to you something new, even more new than that, which is to study nitrate, concentration of nitrate in the ice core from Antarctica. This is the work that we have done with uh, chemists from uh, University of Florence. And we already have some very exciting results. We have a paper not in preparation, it's almost, I would not speculate too much, we will be close to being impressed. What we have here is basically nitrate history for, history for the last uh, 12,000 years or so. Okay, oh, sorry, time go from here to there. That is his fault, he make the plot that way. <laughs> and what we're trying to do here, as you know, Dr. Velasco is an expert in uh, signal processing. This is a very new technique. It's not that new, but it's people who study fluid turbulence invented some of those techniques. It's called the wavelet transform. So you can use this tiny wavelet rather than sine and cosine, by the way. So compared to standard Fourier technique, I think this is much more superior. One ought to use that. And we are one of those innovative uh, user or application of using wavelet technique. So I want to show you this simple result first. So if you analyze this nitrate concentration, what you find is that there is a very nice concentration of power at this so-called millennia cycle. Okay, 1,500 years or 1,800 years or so. And then it turns out that there's also something even higher, at 3,000 years. And we really believe that this is possibly related to the, the sun's uh, signature. And uh, we have, of course, work to explain that, but we will show you another example. And to highlight what Dr. Velasco can do, I want to show you some previous results produced by our collaborator. Okay? What they do then is that if you want to say that the nitrate represent solar activity, why don't you try to cross the information between nitrate and carbon-14 in this case, and try to see that on which time scale, here is plotting in terms of the time scale from about 200 years to about 5,000 years, and then this is the actual time. So over this time period to see where they actually agree. So there are actually certain scale where they agree. But the limitation of such process is that as, you, as I told you, you not only have a beryllium-10, a, a, a carbon-14 or nitrate, you have a lot more series that you should analyze. And these people are limited by only doing this two at a time. Okay? And to show you the, 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 the amount of uh, paperwork, I will call this paperwork because I'm somewhat an arrogant or lazy mathematician somehow, that these people have to cross between two series and produce all kinds of data and all kinds of results. By the way, there's another very interesting uh, notification to try to explain to you why the nitrate representing solar activity rather than any earth kind of uh, related issues, you know, like if you correlate with the, the sulfur, the, you know, the calcium and nitrous, the, the sodium content, you know, from the ice, you will see there's no correlation. If you correlate with the, you know, the solar, well-known solar activity proxy like carbon-14, the beryllium-10, you have some much more interesting relationship. But Remember, this is really a lot of labor. We are somewhat uh, refined people, so we say, forget about all this. Why don't we do something better? Which, well, here's another example of how they do it. Okay, so they have to plot two, one at a time. And now I want to highlight this work that we have done, which is work in press. We have collaborated with uh, people from Finland, uh, Russia, uh, Italy, China, Taiwan, everywhere. So we try to now cross-correlate three series at a time. This technique has never existed before, before Dr. Velasco and I look into this. 
So we're now able to do this for 100 series or 1,000 series if we want it. Okay? So we are very excited to produce this first paper. My job here is to try to discuss with him the details of a much more uh, mathematical works to try to explain this technique and perhaps show it to the world and give it to the world to use it. Because science is like that, it should be transparent, you should be able to apply this. And for here, we show you that for three solar activity proxy, there are some hints, indeed, of the well-known. Because the point is that these three proxies are completely different archives. Carbon-14 comes from three rings, beryllium-10 comes from ice. Some of these beryllium-10 are actually from Greenland, because from Antarctica is not as good. Our nitrate is from Antarctica. The completely different regional phenomenon if you think that this is basically Earth processes controlling this. If it's Earth processes controlling this, I don't think this tree would agree in that time scale. Okay? There are a lot more details, of course. I do encourage you to read the paper, and I do encourage uh, Professor Velasco to give a speech on this topic when, it's, when uh, he gets to it. It's up to him. And then I want to show you that even finer resolution that we have nitrate concentration that you can compare with beryllium and then you can do all kinds of study. Here's another preliminary example of what our technique can do. We combine two different nitrate data sets because it's measured by one Indian group and one, uh, one of this Italian group. And the Indian folks has given us the data too. And then cross-correlate and then it turns out that you can see this is that famous uh, so-called well, people like to call it Gleisberg. We like to call it Yoshimura and Gleisberg. If you read our paper, you know why. Because credit is important. Who did it first? And on this time scale, 60 years, there seems to be some very interesting coherent time scale. Okay? So it's really a lot of exciting work ahead. This is just to give you a preview of what we can do. Okay? And we, we of course, open for collaboration if you have some good data over the Holocene. So just a brief uh, uh, conclusion which is don't even have to use my own words. For this famous person, Professor Gerard Bond, who already passed away, but he has studied very carefully about how the, the, the ice, the drifting ice from the North Atlantic, and then how the, the actually the grain is falling down under the ocean sediment, where he studied the details. It turns out that he found a lot of this 1,500 years uh, kind of a cycle, cyclical modulation of that, and then he suspects that it's related to, to solar activity. And the, late, the last place in which you get one of these low, because you get a lot of this low, which for him is basically high, a lot of the grain, because it's only cold period that you, this thing is drifting south, the ice. And then, so one, the last one was one the minimum. So it shows you that it may not be coincidental at all. There's a physical relationship that one ought to pursue. And indeed, it is our duty to try to learn more about this. Now, to introduce you more fun stuff about one the minimum, because sometimes, Coal is not completely all bad. One of the most favored, uh, famous time, which is again, like I told you, this is, this is now trying to measure not the solar activity, just to measure, let's say, three rings index, to trying to measure maybe the moisture or the precipitation. This is from, uh, this record actually, I believe is from uh, somewhere near Italy or, or even in, in Southwest, where you can measure the climatic information. You can clearly see that over this time period from 1600 or 1640 or 20 or so until 1710, the, the ring index is a bit smaller than average. Okay? In fact, it's one of the more exceptional period compared to, well, here is also good, but it's much shorter duration. That's probably related to the Dalton minimum. This one is related to the Mondon minimum. But over this time period, because of the particular condition, guess what we get? We get this beautiful violin. Her uh, Dr. Velasco's uh, daughter play violin, so I thought I'd show him a little bit of, you should buy one of these for your daughter. So it's very uh, violin, right? So you need to know what? Ecology too, right? You need to know how the plants respond to the climatic variables, okay? Sometimes it's, it's really complicated to try to interpret the tree ring index in terms of just temperature. It's not a good idea sometimes. So one has to be a lot more careful but from that perspective, you actually do have some useful information, which the whole point I'm trying to tell you. And of course, actual history. Because the tree has to grow near where the Mr. Sarzavari is there. They have to go and chop it down and make, it, make a nice violin or something. Because the density of the wood is so high that supposedly, I'm not a musician, but the sound is supposed to be really spectacular. So that's just uh, the way that the sun is looking at us. Remember, it's very, very interesting, the sun really can, can pull out a lot of tricks that we still not yet fully understand. But we have to learn more. Now let me quickly go into a set of what we call 
fine climate relations study that I have produced, especially with uh, collaborate with uh, Professor Velasco, Velasco here. I'm, I'm not so used to mentioning two times, so it's Velasco Herrera, I apologize, but I always use this Velasco. Sometimes a big mistake. I started by actually seeing this kind of graph. It was an Arctic temperature curve, okay? Remember, I, I, I'm a very careful person. I just want to give you a sense of how hard this study is. Even this line here, I check exactly what happened, okay? You really need to know your data or else you just don't publish. And then the red curve here is basically the best estimates of the sun irradiance, okay? Over this time period, from about 1870 to 2000 or so, at that time when I published in 2004 or 2005. Look, it's very interesting. Every time that the, the sun irradiance goes up, it appears that the Arctic warm. And then even when the, the sun decided to go down, the Arctic follow, and then goes up again. So what I'm trying to tell you is that although this looks like a statistical relationship, there is a physics here, which I have worked very hard. When I first published in it, I didn't give a full explanation. It took me another four years to write out the whole picture, which I'll explain to you. But the first test, when you see something like that, it's just statistical correlation. Remember, statistics is completely lies, okay? You have to really work out about what the physical mechanism is. So the first test, if this thing worked for the whole Arctic, so now let me try to study. This is the same picture, but now we smooth out the inter annual changes. So you use a filter, right? You try to study the multi-decadal changes. Now if you consider the Atlantic sector, the Pacific sector, and the Greenland sector, the first consistency check. If you see it for the whole area, you ought to be able to see. If this physics is real, you ought to see it from the regional sense. It seems to be there. And then I can even go down to individual location, okay? From Gotap Loop and Amasta Lake. Somehow this thing shifted, okay, yeah. That's why I don't like Macintosh. <laughs> I don't use Macintosh. But it's still there. Okay? So that's good. First, first you know, that's, that's a very basic thing that one has to do before one wants to publish. One has to be very careful to see that this is meaningful. I don't like to publish things that is not meaningful that you have to take away several, you know, less than a few months ago. That's just silly. So in this aspect, you have to learn about climatology and uh, meteorology, which is really one of the things that most people don't want to study, actually. It's a very complicated one, meteorology, but it has a lot of very interesting uh, physics stuff that is very useful to learn. And here now, I want to explain some of the physical part and mechanism. So my scheme, as I published in 2009, really spell out the whole thing. As of today, I would say five years later, I don't have to change anything. It's still there. My whole idea is that basically that you have the iridium changing, what you do then is basically you cause the big picture changes, which is the equator to pole temperature gradient first, right? And of course, then that immediately means heat, moisture, transport, okay? And through the fast process first, which is the atmosphere, the fastest. Then what you do is that you affect the Arctic, the thermal property, which is the temperature. You affect the hydrology and the cryosphere. The cryosphere is important because that's where you have fresh water, the fresh water is important in the sense that you finally, the fresh water and come down, exposed to Greenland left and right, basically the east and the west, that even the west there is a path in which the fresh water come out. That's much closer to the sinking region in North Atlantic, so-called the thermal hayline circulation, THC, or people like to use the phrase North Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, right? And how that affects this overturning circulation, this giant gyre, this giant uh, circulation belt, by the way, the physics is much more complicated. It's not a belt. <laughs> There's no such way. Ocean is somewhat diffusive and vacuous, so you have to work out all the details. And then ultimately, this effect will propagate down. I'll explain to you the specific evidence through western boundary. It's not a specific western boundary current, but it propagate down. And then affect even the tropical Atlantic, so-called the ITCZ rain belt. And then ultimately, I can even show you this thing is affecting ENSO on multi-decadal timescale. So that's the cartoon to spread this out. This is actually a salinity map. Red means very salty. Green means a lot of fresh water. Blue is even more fresh, okay? So it's trying to show you the path that is involved in my scheme. The weather rain showing you the atmospheric process. Most of these uh, arrows here are showing you the oceanic path, okay? We're talking about the hydrology and the thermal property balance, okay? And that's my... That's basically my scheme, and ultimately I can show you, if I have time, a three hours talk, I will show you the whole thing, right? I can explain the evidence. Today we will talk about here, of course, your, your most uh, important region. I can tell you all the data from here, 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 everything that I have examined over these years. 
And I'm very appreciative of uh, Dr. Velasco for the help. <coughs> it bring a lot of insight. This is just a very nice uh, uh, picture to show you that there are slow process, there are fast process. These are all basically jet stream, right? These are stuff that is in 10 kilometers, traveling at 300 to 400, uh, 600 even. The peak speed is that fast, okay? It's really, really fast circulating uh, things around, which show you that how energy are being carried and, and pro different properties and chemicals are being transported across this whole world. It's very, very fast. So, look, study of this sun climate is basically study of sun climate weather too. You need to know how this fast process actually works, okay? I, I can give you a lot of details on this, but let me skip very quickly to show you the best evidence I have for this relationship. This is actually now a plot showing you taking actually the map that is available from the instrumental data from the United Kingdom, the Climatic Research Unit. They have turned into all the temperature measurement in grid box. You take all the boxes, and then you compute actually what we call the temperature gradient, okay, the difference between that versus the latitude. And then you produce this map over this time series over the Northern Hemisphere. I hope you will not be surprised if I put my solar curve on it. Okay. This is trying to tell you that there are a lot of physics involved, and if the sun can modulate this thing on a large scale sense, then it ought to tell you a lot of information. By the way, I hope that you do have time to read that, this paper that I just published in 2013. And it, it, it tried to tell us a lot more story, which I don't have time to get into now, but it's very, very interesting in terms of climate dynamics. It's all about studying dynamics. It's not forcing and feedback. It's all about dynamics, the evolution of the dynamics. I hope some of you know that this system is somewhat chaotic sometimes. So, you know, and of course, there are also some now I'm trying to explain. Let me move a little quicker. I'm trying to explain to you that why do you need this ocean conveyor belt to work? Okay, this is a very, very well, sh well, uh, uh, not so easy to explain because it could be just a surface, you know, like Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream is just a surface phenomenon. Why do you need water that is forming, you know, basically winter when you have a convection system that the, the water actually can go from surface all the way down to 2,000 meters, guys? There's a lot of energy involved. And what I'm able to show to you is that it has to involve this because the work by Professor Peter de Manoco from Colombia on Lamont, I show you that he drilled core around that area in uh, Nova Scotia, where one of the core is at about 1,000 meters, one is about 1,800 meters. And to try to measure magnesium calcium ratio to show you the bottom water temperature, they have very slightly different property. Okay, you can see over time, 4,000 years, the behavior is very different. But now let's come to this, this part here where we're trying to correlate with the world. It's obvious that if you take the top one, the 1,000 meter one, it will not show, this is now the bottom one, okay? Show you the bottom return path is very important. If you compare with, let's say, some work done by David Loon and, and, uh, and Bill Curry from uh, Woods Hole, or you show it with uh, this much more famous, this, this work for titanium measurement from uh, Karikau Basin, is to measure the titanium so that you can measure actually how wet and high dry so that this stuff is actually coming off from the, 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 the river in uh, Venezuela, right? So it's showing you this. But you can see, these two completely different places, they are related, okay? But they're related to the bottom water, it's not the top water. That shows you that you have to invoke thermal hairline circulation, okay? And here's another puzzle, right? If, uh, look, I'm plotting here, I'm showing a work from a, uh, uh, Professor Jan uh, uh, Jensen from uh, Norway, Bergen, showing you their estimates of the proxy of the Nordic temperature, and this is the Karakau Basin Titanium Index. Remember, Norway is up here. Hey, just know the geography. Why would they correlate? Okay, obviously the answer maybe is supplied by these kind of linkages, which is really really important. It told you that fast process, slow process, all somehow coordinate. And if you un un understand in terms of other, oh, here's, here's a very important uh, piece of evidence. It turns out that the effects I told you started from the convecting site, okay? There are a few convecting sites. One is in the Labrador Sea, one is in the Norway area, okay? This is the stuff where you water sink down so you, you form the bottom part of the flow. And then, of course, supposedly you go to the Southern Ocean and then the, the, the upper part of the layers go through the, the Gulf Stream, right? But how do the, the, the signals propagate from north to south? It's actually through deep process. What is important here is basically to try to show you, this is actually your, your, about your region now, which is in the equatorial tropical Atlantic. 
where it's showing you that if you measure the temperature in the north, northern Atlantic and then southern, then you measure this stuff that is actually a dipole. Every time it's warm here, it's cold here. It's warm here, it's cold here. Right? So there's this dipole relationship. If you plot that, which is actually this curve, the red curve, and then if you plot this stuff called the, this is the convective thickness of the, of the water, you can measure that, okay? How thick or how, how thin it is. It going up and down, it has a lot of inter-annual variability. But if you correlate these two, if you measure it at the same time, it won't work. It has our phase relationship. What? And then, but if you put this one in the liberal sea and then you take the tropical Atlantic dipole, if you delay by five years, it shows you that the time to go to there is five years, more or less reasonable. If through western boundary current, it's even faster, by the way. So this is a very special kind of trap Kelvin wave that is very important, and it's spelled out completely by this guy from, from uh, oceanographer from, uh, from uh, Woodsall. I know his name, of course, I know him. And then this is one of the results that I publish that shows you that this relationship, this is my solar uh, activity stuff again, and then this is the best estimate of so-called from all the instrumental data of the overturning circulation. Measure in units of sphere drop, right? Because it's a volumetric flow. And here, again, if you plot it at the same time, it won't work. All it's saying is that there has to be a delay in the system. That's the physical test of the theory. If your theory is correct, and you know that this thing takes time to propagate from one place to another, here I require 10 years. Which means the sun starts about 10 years ago, and then what you're seeing is the 10-year response after that. There is some relationship. And then, Mr. Velasco, future. Future later, we'll talk about that, but that's dangerous. <laughs> we don't want to get there. But I want to show you that around your area, now I want to focus on this bottom part. This is the bottom flow that is going back and coming through the Florida current. But do we have evidence, actually, from paleo evidence? There's a lot of different evidence and different time scale, but I want to focus on is one to 2,000 years. And then this is the surface, this is the wind gyro system, this is the Gulf Stream stuff, but the, the bottom one is much more interesting for me. But there's actually work done by Bill Curry and the student, David Lund. They have produced a beautiful work. Ah, oh, so much uh, Delta 18, oh, kind of uh, from many, many places, they compute gradients and all that. Somehow they were able to resolve the flow, so the history of this transport through the Florida current is, is showing you like this. Which means when you are warm, actually it's a bit faster. When you're cold, it's a bit slower. Okay, somewhat consistent with our picture. But what I'm trying to tell you that you have, because remember, little ice age is a time period in which that the Earth indeed built to a very large uh, uh, ice mass. Okay, that's why you call it little ice age, because the last ice age was 20,000 years ago, right? This has only happened about four or five hundred years ago that you indeed have a bit of a slowdown in the transport. Okay. You see, to study this, you need all of that, okay? You need to study sedimentology, so on and so forth. And then, of course, key thing is oceanography, which most people also don't want to get into, but I tell you, oceanography is a, a bit of a secret that you have to study that very, very carefully to understand all that phenomenon. Finally, what does it have to do with Mexico? All right, let me tell you now what I understand about this. By the way, I completely a novice, so I'll share with you my own understanding. But I just looked this up over the last two months. I think I understand now. I want to tell you something that I felt somehow unique because I don't see it being discussed yet. Just to, you know, not to show up, but just to tell you what I understand about this problem. The first one is from the uh, UNAM famous group, Lozano Garcia, and the student. And what they do is, of course, is to try to go to the lakes. And they are the expert in paleoecology. I hope you know what the subject is. You study plants, pollen, and all that stuff all this wonderful work. And uh, their particular core is basically at these two lakes, right around here. But then there are a lot of previous studies, so they're trying to combine together all these different studies. Okay? In fact, Mr. Vel Professor Velasco and I are now are taking all of the time series. That we got. Remember, we have the technique to cross correlate as many series as you want. We're going to do all of that, of course. And then try to see whether there's any relationship to what we understand about the sun. I do believe that we have, but we can study them. And guess what? If there's no relationship with the sun, what do you do? You publish, and then you say it's not there. Period. Because the point is that people say, oh, you only want to study, you only want to make the claim. No, 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 not like that. It's about what the truth is. Let the result and data stand. Okay? And very, very be careful with that. 
So the whole idea of that is that during this time period, this author, well, young group, is saying that Little Ice Age is from 1350 to 1850. That's more or less okay. That definition is okay. And it says that uh, what is very important in this work is that they were able to provide an upper bound, which means you ask yourself, how cold is cold in Little Ice Age during in Mexico? For the land part, they clearly, from the species and all that, they were able to bound it to no more than two degrees colder. I would have to trust them, but I have to investigate this myself. Because science is what? It's about reading people? No, 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 no. You have to do that, your own understanding. It's a lot of hard work. So I like that number. I want to tell you that number. Okay? And it says that those guys, as I, I'm not trying to say this myself, I like Mondo Minimum because I wrote the little book, uh, Labor of Love, for, those, for the Mondas. And you can see, they say that this perhaps corresponds to the Mondo Minimum weak solar activity. And then during that time period, it's cold, of course. Okay. And now I show you the glacier information. This is also from your UNAM uh, work. This person, Raske Salem, I never met him. Hopefully he's somewhere here. What he has studied is this actually glaciers in some of this volcanic belt where you live. It's actually the ice grow quite a bit. It moved down the valley by almost 250 meters, according to his estimate, which is quite significant. Okay. It tells you that that condition was wet was probably where somehow that winter you were able to make more ice, okay? And some of the ice didn't go away because it was cold, okay? And then what you need to figure out is that where the moisture comes from. Well, it's probably because you guys have high elevation. Okay? And then on the low land, it's basically dry. It's very well known all over the world. You know, ice age is almost like a little drought age, okay? That's a word also done by some uh, expert from uh, uh, on study of Mexico weather. I'm sure you all know about her. And here's the evidence, but from a slightly different place on the glacier growing. Remember, little ice age. It really means that the ice are growing, okay? This is showing you a data set from uh, Venezuela, from this place, okay? It's, uh, it's from the lake study. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that precisely, but Mukubaji. <laughs> Let me say that, but that's the top one, showing you that the glacier really advanced, okay? And the time period is more or less like the Mondo Minimum, the Sporer, and then, of course, the Wolf Minimum that the size of the glacier actually grow. They make a very specific measurement, of course, I hope we don't have to get into this to try to explain that why is this related to ice. Okay, the, so it shows you that just, uh, over a certain time period when the sun activity is weak, you have a very uh, clear signature of what the sun is doing actually, imprinting on all these things, from glaciers to, to plant ecology to lake temperature to anything you want, precipitation, you know, ITCZ, rain belt, you, you know, that kind of stuff. I want to show you too another, another new data that just came out, which is this work from Jamaica, Caribbean around your area. I want to come to the whole region stuff in a minute. But to show you that indeed, this is a place that on the lowland is actually significant droughts in terms of the interpretation of these authors. Okay? They are from the uh, University of Jamaica. And then of course you have your own, uh, this is the one that I don't know how to pronounce, but this is a beautiful work done by David Hodel, right? Everybody knows the drought region. But then from Laguna Punte, actually it's wet during that time. So the whole thing has to be explained somewhat. Okay? And then the question is, how do you explain this? Right? Now I want to show you a different perspective. That was from the, just now when I say it's 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius cooler, that was from the perspective of land and ecology study. But from oceanography, ocean study, ocean sediment, you can see the range of the temperature is slightly different. There are small changes, can be larger, three degrees at least, even. Okay? And, I, and, and the, the outer line there is where the beginning of where I want to introduce you to what is important. Typically, traditionally, everybody thought that in terms of your weather here, by the way, temperature I presume is a lot less interesting, so people here always worry about rain, 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 right? And so we want to study the rain changes. And I'm trying to outline, you see here on this outline here, 28.5 degrees Celsius. That is the region enclosed by what we call the Western Hemisphere or the Atlantic Wampu. It's called the Wampu region. The, that temperature is very, very interesting. I hope some of you know that when you reach temperature like that, what you do is that the system started to convect. So deep convection started to form. Okay? Then you started to have very interesting. So the question is that how important is this Wampu, compared to, let's say, famous Enso, the El Nino, 
The you know, southern oscillation in eastern equatorial Pacific slightly lower, but it's around there. Okay, because typically people are trying to explain everything using that. But I, today I want to propose to you that the the warm pool area is very important. Just to give you the climatology. Okay, that that is temperature. Okay, that is temperature over season. It's always the warmest around September, October or so, or, or so when the sun started to migrate south again. And then here is showing you the size of the warm pool. Okay, it's typically around that region, around the blue box at the top. It's showing you that over four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, and the temperature you can read for yourself in terms of the map, right? Very, very warm region. It turns out that this side on this part is not as, as important as the one on the right-hand side, on this side. And forget about this. This is showing you how climate model can do, and this is actual observation. I always believe in observation. And it's showing you the climatology, right? The size of this. But over interannual changes, look at what happened. This is the area, this is the time when certain time, certain year, you know that the warm pool size completely reduced by quite a bit. If you define by that kind of criteria, okay? And then when it's slightly larger, it's actually larger, warm, warm pool. What I'm trying to propose to you is that on multi-decadal and centennial time scale, perhaps that this thing is far more important than been realized so far, okay? And, and this is just that in, in this aspect of the talk, the final part of the talk, I really want to tell you about this thermodynamics variable. And then you know that that ain't gonna work. If you want to talk about moisture, it's not only how much evaporation, you also need to talk about evaction. So we talk about the dynamics too. Okay, you didn't do it. But let me show you now how you actually correlate the warm pool the AWP index. Let's look at focus on this this panel here, and then you correlate that uh, the index with precipitation in August, September, and o uh, October. You can see around here you have some very interesting correlation. And then I didn't have a plot to show you the El Nino correlation, but I want to show you the most important one is that if you take the partial correlation from this, if you take out the Nino tree, look at the pattern. Okay. What I'm trying to tell you that the Nino tree is confusing you with the Atlantic warm pool, just for the purpose of discussing here, right? And I think this kind of a variable is really worthy of more study. Certainly, it's still the beginning. Because so far, I think most of the work on this area just started to publish maybe around, you know, 2000 something or so. And here now, what I'm trying to point in this stuff is that, what is important here? I would say that the Atlantic warm pool area you also have, of course, the rain belt, which is called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, ITCZ. You all know that, right? This is for summer, this is for winter. Winter, you see, move way south. And then another really, really important one is actually low-level flow. Okay? It's called the Caribbean Low-Level Jet, CLLJ, okay, that variable. And then now it's showing you the path of that flow. And I think these are very important to consider. And I will propose that during the Little Ice Age, this, this jet flow is a bit higher, okay? The, the warm pool didn't completely disappear. And then you have enough moisture source so you can explain a lot of things, by the way, just by making a few of these simple rules. And then probably the winter pattern will be slightly different than that. You have to work out the dynamics, which I'll look into it. And then just to introduce you that this, this zonal wind is actually quite strong, you know? 40 uh, kilometers per hour, you know? Very fast wind. These are the low level jet, really near, almost near surface. By the way, this is pressure unit, right? The height. You all know this is sea level, and then this is up a little bit. It's around uh, 920 or so millibar, or hectopascal. Um, I'm focusing only on uh, July, of course, because that's why it's more important than the winter stuff. But it's trying to show you that this jet intensity, this low-level jet, is very, very important as well. And then this is showing you the correlation, as you can see, winter, not, not as interesting as summer, right? You can see the very significant region that is related to how strong and how weak the intensity of the low-level jet is. Okay, and I propose that these are the three ingredients, three four ingredients that you would need to have a much more complete story and explanation about when to anticipate drought or not. Right? Probably you also will have to worry about rain. But then there's another very important thing to control this 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 low-level jet. Actually, it's actually a, a temperature sea surface temperature around tropical North Atlantic region, okay? These are basically 10 to 20 degree north, you know, right in the, the stuff. I don't have a map to show you, but I want to show you my theory that I published 
independent of all the stuff that I just say, if I plot the sea surface temperature around that region, okay, and then we have plot my my sun uh, estimates, solar irradiance estimates, uh, it doesn't look that good, okay, and that is taken from what we call tropical North Atlantic. It's a very key region also for formation of hurricane, okay, by the way. And well, you can see the exact coordinate, but it's more or less in that region. It's well known because that's the high pressure region that control how where the jet is placed, and even ITCC have to fight against those things. And then ultimately, if you shift it, which is my theory, predict that there ought to be a delay because remember, my effects all started in the Arctic, propagate down, and then it's doing that. Okay. So I think that at least some of this picture is still consistent. And then now I want to add in the final picture, which is the ITCC, the rain belt. The rain belt, of course, over uh, you know the whole year is shifted quite a bit. But on on actually centennial, like 1,200 years, you know, like 2,000 year time scale, you know, over that time period, if you plot this particular index, this is actually done by people from uh, sediment in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, actually, you know, your colleagues, Paul and those guys from USGS to Denver. And they measure this abundance of this particular species and supposedly this species will give you some information on the ITCC rain belt. And more north or more south. When it's cold, actually the, the ITCC rain belt tends to be pushed further south. Okay? And then when it's warm, it actually tends to be pushed further north. Okay? And what is plotted on the blue one, which is trying to show you the estimate of the, car you know, what? remember we talk about solar activity proxy, this is using only carbon-14, is showing you that every time you have a, a low solar activity, you tend to have the ITCC move a little bit south, and this relationship seems to work, okay? Although their dating is extremely bad. These people are shifting the thing by about 100 years, okay? And that's important. Actually, that's why the dating is important, okay? But at least what it's telling you is that it's very hard to reject the hypothesis that the sun doesn't correlate with these things, okay? Science is about rejecting the hypothesis, right? It's not about confirming anything. You can't confirm anything or 100% sure. No such thing. Okay? I hope that lesson is important. And then just to sketch you the final dynamic, because people have proposed this kind of picture before, about how the tropical you know, north, and, and north and South Atlantic dipole, the temperature, surface temperature, is actually causing the ITCC to move north and move south. But I have a much more complete picture. I added the, the Arctic freshwater source and that has a relationship with how fast and how slow the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic controlling it. So my full picture is to try to tell you the constraint of this interhemispheric SSD contrast is very not too demanding. What I'm trying to tell you is that this picture is completely within the true reality that I suspect. It's showing you that during strong MOC, you have this thing move a little bit uh, uh, north, and then during cold time, it moves a little bit south. The ITCC moves up. But I say don't forget the Arctic freshwater source because I think the fastest process is to do that first. It's very hard to imagine what can cause the gradient to do these things in the Atlantic itself, the tropical region. So finally, I do want to show this very impressive part. In my point of view, Dr. Velasco was not impressed. He said it has to be true. <laughs> he, Dr. Velasco has just produced a very beautiful work, in my opinion. It's basically how to estimate the total solar irradiance using only giving, well, he has a, a new technique that somehow tell this automaton, these machines to learn how to actually interpolate and how to make gases by giving some information like beryllium-10 or, or carbon-14, which is very elegant mathematically. And what he produces is actually time series of the solar irradiance plotted in red. And I happen to in, you know, I always remember things funny. When you become a scientist, you, you look at the curve, you always remember which one is going up, which one is going down. And I know exactly this curve. This is the K from China. I was working with another colleague, and then I saw this curve. Hey, it looked the same like Velasco curve, but this one has to delay by 60 years. What I'm trying to tell you is that this effect that happened right here in the North Atlantic and South Atlantic, anywhere, propagate. In fact, I told you I have written several papers that explain how it goes to the east. This is in China. And the relation is quite good, actually. You have low, you know, you have very dry periods, and then when the activity is weak, and then when it's strong, it gets wet again. How, I mean, if it's not the sun, I don't know what it is, actually. How, how does the, 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 you know, the, this is basically from staclamide in the cave, right? How does this thing know about these things? So I, I really think that the hypothesis is rather strong, and we're not to study them. 
So one line conclusion is the study of sun climate relation and physical mechanism is very important and it's wholly viable, especially with this scenario that I'm trying to describe, I call it bottoms up because there's a much more complicated one coming from the stratosphere which involves solar UV radiation so on and so forth. But uh, you know, that's another long lecture. The sun is smiling again on another day. I remember, see, I also watch the sun every day, so he, he, he's the guy who watches the sun every day. And uh, my final bottom line is very simple because I do want to make uh, one small statement. I don't like to be controversial here because as you all know, people and humanity appears to be very concerned about human use of the fossil fuel and then in fact put this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then try to say that it will cause substantial damage and so on and so forth. And I guess I share the same uh, opinion, but then on the scientific point of view, I would say I'm a little bit more, uh, I have more humility in the sense that people are always trying to sell you that the future is always scary if you don't do something about it. You know, you, you really have to buy, you know, a thousand, a million dollars of insurance to try to protect your house from, from flooding or sea level rise, according to them. But sometimes people are giving you the wrong and false scientific information. That's why the topic can become very controversial, which is not, not right. But for science, I like to quote this person, Alfred North Whitehead. He's actually a logician from Cambridge, and then he came to Harvard before he died. The reason of this link is uh, Professor uh, Velasco, he's a mathematician, as I told you. He said that uh, most of the mathematics in Mexico is actually was helped by this person by the, well, per, by the name of George David Burkhoff. He's also a very fine mathematician, a bit like... Uh, I would say, uh, you know, off the level of, uh, yeah, so this very, very finest mathematician. And the idea then is that, you know, if you think about the future, of course it's always dangerous. But then one must not forget. If you started to, you know, if it's black, you cannot keep saying that it's a bit gray. No, 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 it's black. It has to be black. Because people are trying to tell me, this black is not black, it's a bit gray. But I say science doesn't tell me that. It has to be black if it's black. If it's white, it's white. If it's gray, it's gray. Okay, I go with it. But I'm not going to be bowed down to that kind of pressure. So it's important that we keep science straight. Okay? Because future is always dangerous. You have to always make sure that science stays so that the future can operate on its own. I think that's about all, and uh, I thank you for your attention.